The two cars just didn't go through. They know there's not money. As of today, my account was negative a thousand dollars. I haven't even made the payment on this thing. Like, where's this? Where's my check coming from? It's embarrassing to be a crew member. It's hard to take them seriously. The customer doesn't want you there. I'll try to do things as fast as I can. Hey, you're getting way overpaid for like what you're willing to do. Behind the strip club. This is an absolute nightmare. Please tell me this is a joke. I'd say I'm in a hundred and some thousand dollars of debt between equipment. So that got out of hand real quick. I want to see him go bankrupt. Seems like things have just been really out of hand lately. You are asking for disaster. Today we're going to Freedom Lawn Care, where there's over $100,000 in debt, $15,000 of that is credit card debt, and they have a negative $1,000 bank balance. Five employees haven't paid himself, the owner, for four months. Let's go see if we can turn this thing around. You see that Kubota over there? That's a lot of debt sitting over there. Good morning, brother. Good, all of our camera gear didn't come through on the, the plane. So don't mind our, our lackluster setup. You're good. Cool, man, good to meet you. Don't mind my lackluster it, setup, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> we actually, we rent this house here. The owner just lets us oh, use nice. this lot. Oh, um, nice. Nice, man. I this is the place you want your shop, out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, so I, I grew up working on this ranch here. We do lawn maintenance, landscape, uh, Christmas lights. Yeah, I don't come from money. I've built all this by myself, and it's been a been a grind. I'd say I'm in a hundred and some thousand dollars of debt between equipment, skid steer, and other stuff. Revenue this year, 2023, what do you think you're doing? I know the numbers are a little bit hairy. We're, we're gonna hit 200,000. Okay. For cool. sure. Um, 250 might be a, a long shot. I see the Kubota. Do you guys use the, uh, quite a bit of landscaping then? And, and some lawn care? What's kind of the split what in terms of revenue? 75% landscaping, Got 25% it. lawn care. What's the payment on this each month? 1200. Do you guys use it quite often? Like once a week kind it's of like thing? It's like when we're using it, we're using it. Right. We're not, we're not. There's been times where I'm like, holy crap, I'm so thankful we have this thing. Yeah. It's like, it's just so handy. Yeah. And then there's times where I'm like, geez, I haven't even made the payment on this thing. Like yeah. it hasn't even paid itself right. for the month. So it sounds like you bought the $70,000 piece of equipment. He doesn't use it very often. And it's put a whole bunch of debt on the business. And then you have other businesses too, right? Yeah. So okay, what is that? I invest in real estate. I started doing that this year. And then I have a hunting outfitter a couple hours away from here. Okay. And I do that. For, I mean, we're about to start up doing that. So So do you, do you like take people on tours or? Is yeah, so we take people on guided hunts. I have six employees doing that. We cool. have a chef, a lodge. So the hunting lodge is for my hunting business. Got it. So, so in Kansas That there. was my real estate. So I bought two pieces of real estate this year. One was a flip house and one was the hunting lodge. But that's all buy and hold for my personal business. Right. Got it. We're going to do 250 grand in that business. On that one? Sort of this winter. Cool, man. So we're kind of running into, I don't know how, like, when we want to get into this. But yeah, yeah. I have a couple issues with employees. A lot of what I think is going on here is my lack of like leadership and just being able to like tell people, hey, this is what you do. This yeah. is what you need to do. Go do it. This is your job. I'm like very non-confrontational. I don't, I can tell. I don't yeah. like telling people what to do. The office gal, she is she full-time, part-time? She's she... 20 hours a week. Got it. She's clocking hours, but like she's not always doing stuff for the business. Okay. Yep. I texted her the other day about it. And I was like, hey, did you reach out to these snow contracts and try to sell these? Yeah. And I just, like, didn't hear anything back. I'm assuming she didn't text me back because she didn't do them. And then as far as Jacob, he's a great employee. He's that guy that, like, you hire and literally, like, changes your business. Yeah. Like, if I lost him, I'd, I don't know what I would do. Uh, I, see, I was needing a job real fast because I walked off of somebody's job, and I seen a lawn truck. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I can do that. Like, they're always hiring. The other one... Etienne, he's my best friend. I don't really know what you guys are <laughs> really here for. I mean, best friend since like high school. Yeah. I hired him as project manager. Like, he's a lot more responsible. I know mm -hmm. his background. I know, like, I can trust him with my my debit cards. And he came up with the idea he wanted to start a landscaping business. And I thought he was crazy, but here he is now. I was a welder. I got tired of it. You hired him originally as ma project manager, 
Yes. And now, really, I hear it is more of a and now like what's overpaid hap- employee type situation. Yes, very much so. Okay. And you almost feel like this weird cultural tension between like him and the other guy. The other guy, and they're they're pretty good friends. I mean, I've about gotten straightened out now, but at first, you know, he, he just had a real bad attitude. Didn't really want to work all that hard. Because <laughs> this guy knows how to do everything. Basically, runs this thing. Yep. And this guy's getting paid this. X amount of dollars, yeah. and then this guy is getting paid X amount of dollars, and he like doesn't know how to do much. This is like the first actual like landscape business that I've worked for. It's a lot harder than somebody next to this. <laughs> What's the right thing to do for the business, right. not for anybody else, but for the business? Because that's what we're doing here. Yeah. And, and ultimately, like making that. the right decision for the business is still better for them because the business stays in business. Yeah. And right now, like financially, we're actually putting them in a bad spot due to the fact that it's not financially viable. Would you rather Jacob be the person that kind of runs things? He has the qualities to run it. Like if I care about this thing 100%, he cares about it 99%. He literally tells me all the times I came in, I want to make you so much money that like when you pay me, you don't have to worry about it. Mm-hmm. Does he know the finances of the business right now a little bit? Oh yeah, yeah, I'm definitely okay. aware. He don't talk about it, but it's like, it's obvious. Um, Sometimes I'm like, where's this, where's my check coming from? Like I'll try to do things as fast as I can and like I'll stay late, finish up a job, you know, cause I know if he don't get paid, I don't get paid eventually. Probably struggling a little bit. I know we're not doing too bad. So your hope right now is keep these three guys busy throughout winter here. You're going to be focusing on the hunting side of things probably throughout the winter. Yep. And then spring come back and then you're yeah. hitting the ground running. Yep. Do you think, assuming that you're able to get laborers, that next year with the current setup in terms of equipment, you could do like 400,000? Do you think that's kind of the goal? I think next year we can do 500 okay. with, with if we have the, the labor. When a business is doing between zero and $200,000 in annual revenue, the owner should really be focused on being a great labor out in the field with their team doing the work. But Luis is really approaching this like a manager. He's having a general manager and an office person and all of the structure in the business when the business isn't big enough for that. I need to talk to Micah, the office admin person, and see if I can shed some light on what's going on. Whoa, we are literally parking here behind the strip club. Please tell me this is a joke. There's currently four people in the organization. Luis, two employees out in the field, and his office admin, Micah. The problem is, is that the whole business is doing $200,000 in annual revenue, which means if you take 200,000 divided by four people, there's less than $50,000 of gross revenue being created per employee. That's really bad. You don't even have to tell me any other number in the business, and I can tell you there's no profit being made. For every four employees, you need to have like one overhead employee. Yeah. And that will be profitable. Right. And then like we're sitting here, we have two employees and two overhead. I can sell as much as I can, but it's just hard because I'm not out there. So, I mean, to be completely transparent, I have no clue what's what. I don't know how to explain to people like, oh, this is what they're doing. So I can only do so much. And that goes back to like, we do too much. Look at that list right there. Mm -hmm. Services we provide. Yeah. We do that whole list of services. If we did like five, six max things on that mm-hmm. and no more, yeah. she would be able to sell it because she would she I'd be could, able to learn. She'd be able to learn six things. Instead of like well, there's 25. 20 things on that list. That and, I, mean, like, I, don't even, okay. I don't even know them front to back. Let me understand the debt for a second. When you say $100,000 <clears> in debt, does that include the skid steer? Uh, skid steer, 73 grand. Okay. Truck, I have 19 grand on it. Okay. And then dump trailer's like 7,500. Got it. And then, just, then the rest is just credit card debt, basically. I mean, yeah, credit card debt is 10 grand. Okay, okay, maybe. okay. This is the bottom line. Some people would be like super pessimistic about the situation because it's a matter of like literally your uh, liabilities like is basically equivalent to your assets. So basically it's like if you sold everything, you can pay off your debts and move on. That's essentially where the business is at now, which if you go below that, it's insolvent which means you typically should sell the business and just move on with life. However, you went from 70,000 to 200,000 and you probably would probably do 400 to $500,000 next year. You will probably become profitable if you do four to 500,000 in annual revenue without having to buy any more trucks or equipment. And you can make your, your labor as much more efficient by cutting all this stuff down. Yeah. Because when I see $200,000 in annual revenue and I know you have a bunch of project costs, um, I say, okay, let's say that's $150,000 in labor revenue. Well, if you take someone that works 2000 hours in the year and you do the math, they're not making a lot per hour. And so either A, you're charging too little or B, they're super inefficient. And so like what, when you go out and bid a job, what's your target hourly rate? Like do you usually shoot for? 65. 65? What do you pay per hour typically for a labor? Like 15 so, to 20 for entry level? Entry level, 
16. Right now, both our people are 20 plus. Okay. Yeah, like right now, I would imagine if I looked at the finances, you're probably sending 70% of your revenue just on wages. By the time you take office and you take your, your employee on the field. That business will never, ever, 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 ever make money at that ratio. No. It needs to be at 40% or below. Yeah. Especially because you have a bunch of material costs as well. So really, it should be like 30% or less. I think that um, a lot of times maybe this business ain't making enough money to, to grow at this point or sustain. This is what we call a classic case of the shiny object syndrome. You think you're an entrepreneur and you start a whole bunch of businesses where if you just focused on one business, you'd actually make more money. I'm equally passionate about both these businesses. Right. I'm passionate about hunting just because that's what I grew up doing. Yeah. Like I love just to go hunting. But as far as like which one I'm more passionate about growing, you could give me a porta potty company and right. I'd be passionate about growing. Just it's I, the game of business. It's like the chase when you're like yeah. a 16 year old boy and you're trying to get a girlfriend. Yeah. That chase of just getting a girlfriend is fun. Yeah. Like that's like the like what business does for me. Yeah. It's like that itch that but, I just love but to this scratch. Is, to use the analogy, that's the equivalent of going after three girls at the same time. Yeah. Probably gonna get burnt, right? <laughs> yeah. Like, focus on one, man. Never met another 20 year old like, like him, I don't think. But sometimes I do worry that maybe he's trying to do too many things at once. And so this is where, this is where it's hard for me when making like a call like, hey, you should get out of the business. Is you're growing quickly and growth sucks cash. And I think you have enough assets to get to 400, 500,000 without having to buy more stuff. Like in my opinion, like the, the challenging part is if you're gonna try to run both, is you need this business to still do at least 25, 30,000 a month just to break even. Because in my mind, it's like, okay, we should just have you and Jacob working all day long. You should be taking calls, emails, estimates throughout the day, but you're primarily just working with him. You just cut out 90% of those services and then you guys become specialists and you can charge more. That's a profitable model. It's not scalable though. So that's the next question is like, well, if you want to build a $10 million business, you're probably on track to do that. Like you're on the right path. How much pain do you want to go through over the next 10 years is the next question. Yeah, losing money, losing employees, just all sorts of stuff going on. You know, I just got married in March. I was about to say, so that's you just got married. I just got married, so I'm like trying to figure out how to be a husband. You just stack on like family, business, faith, everything. You stack on all that stuff on top of each other and you try to make them all work. And then like my brain was just getting like, it just feels like that's about to explode. So that's when I was like, I need somebody to like relieve me of like at least some of the admin stress because that was like killing me. Mm -hmm. That's when I hired her. You shifted that stress and temporarily like, this is awesome. Temporarily just patched it. Yeah. Patched it. And all it does is move the stress to the next spot of just finances. Yeah. Because you can't, the business can't afford that yet. Yeah. It definitely is a band-aid now looking back on it. Yeah. Like, if you were going to keep both. Let's, let's now go down that bridge. Because like I think personally, I would not. I would choose one, I'd spend two years making it extremely profitable, I would then re-enter the industry if that's what I really wanted to do, and I'd do it with cash. Luis is 20 years old, he recently got married, and he's trying to run two different businesses. I can see why he's stressed. The business isn't making money, and worse yet, he's not even paying himself a salary. This means that if you actually took the 70 or $80,000 that would typically go to the owner in the form of salary, it's losing a lot of money actually. In my opinion, to cover the cost of his salary and all the extra wages and the the debt on the business, the business really needs to make about four hundred dollars to $500,000 in annual revenue just to break even. My thought process going into all this was like, we're trying to ultra scale. Like I'm trying to like, I mean, not copy you, but do a similar model. But why ultra scale? What's the motive in all that? What, what, why do you feel like you want to ultra scale? Right, my, my end goal mm -hmm. is 40 locations. Why? Financial freedom and I just love like, the game. The game. Okay. It's, it's fun. Like, well, I believe you will achieve that goal. I think there's a better way of getting there yeah. that creates less stress, less headache, less depression, and more money. Instead of trying to become that now, i.e. having multiple businesses, investing in real estate, etc., start with one thing, make it really profitable, i.e. remove some of the financial stress, then when you go do a second thing, you have the money to do it, do it really, really well. Like I, I always think about the three little pigs. You got the straw, you got the wood, and you got the bricks. Some people are like, I want the brick house. I want to build this incredible massive business. You're going to get hurt trying to do that. You don't know how to build a house. And you have all these heavy bricks that if you build them incorrectly, it's going to fall down on you. Mm -hmm. And that's you know people are like, I'm going to do equipment. I'm going to do the fast way of building this really big business. And they get hurt. When in reality, it's like, just focus on building a straw house. It's really fast, it's cheap, and it falls down, who cares? Build another one real quick. 
Yeah. Right? That is, I'm going to be a laborer. I'm going to really focus on working hard. I'm not going to try to architecting this massive infrastructure of a business. It's like complicated, multiple moving parts and investing and debt and buying people and mergers and acquisitions. That comes later. You will get there. But the most profitable way to build a business is in stages. And the first part is I'm a laborer. I did that for five years. Like I'm allergic to grass. Like it's it horrible. Too. It was painful. Yeah. It took me literally getting almost killed on a dump truck to figure out like, oh, this is probably not what I should be doing the rest of my life. Those first five years were imperative so I could build a business to make profit to then go do other stuff, make the franchise. Like that location funded me to build a franchise that lost hundreds of thousands of dollars every single year because I built the foundation. If it's in year two or three, I was like, man, I want to do something else. Like this isn't big enough. I don't want to be the guy that just keeps doing this forever. Blah, blah. I would have never got to where I'm at today because I would have not built the engine to fund and fuel all the other stuff. Yeah. So the goal that you want to have is admiral. And I think you're going to get there. I think there's a better way of going about it instead of trying to do everything at the same time. If you just put all of your attention on one thing, like selling jobs, and that was all you focused on, you do, you do very well. You'd scale very quickly. If you took all your attention and just focused it on the hunting, you do really, really good. If you focus all your attention on just being a great husband, you do really, really good at it. The problem is we're trying to do all of them right now. And because you're putting 10% of your attention on every single one, they all will fail. It's so hard when everybody's pulling you in a different direction. That's the thing. That's why I asked you your why. It's because it only matters where you want to go. Who cares what other people think? Here's the thing. I bought a house six years ago. At the same point, I started the franchise. Okay. That house has almost doubled in value. Woohoo. $200,000, $250,000. The business I've created probably worth 10 to, million, 10 to $20 million, just the franchise. You spending your time on the thing that you're really good at, the thing that you love, and your why, which is I love the game of business, will lead to better outcomes than real estate. Despite how dire I think the situation really is, I think that Luis is gonna continue pushing forward and trying to run both of the businesses. So using that framework, I gotta try to see how we can make it actually work. So the first thing I wanna do is drill down to see exactly what Micah is doing in the office because she's costing a lot in terms of overhead and I wanna see what she's actually doing on a daily basis to move the needle for the company. So, I mean, to be completely transparent with you, if it's like a small job, so like lawn care or anything like that, I have personally never done a follow-up, but say we hit like a thousand and higher, I always kind of try to do a follow-up and he's really good too about making sure that people have gotten their estimates, especially when it is that much. Mm -hmm. But like I said, if it was just like $50 lawn maintenance, no. If you want it, you'll want it, but I, yeah. you know. Look, I love Micah, but at this size of business, you don't need a full-time office person. And if you're gonna have one, make sure they follow up religiously on every single estimate that's been sent out. We literally have a $6,000 estimate we've sent the customer four weeks ago. It's probably sitting in their spam inbox and we haven't followed up. And then why do we have the two different apps, Yardbook and then Time Tree? That'd be a question. Because... I started with the yard book. I don't like the scheduling on it. Like this app, it's called Time Tree. Sometimes he'll book jobs and he'll know what they are. He'll know how much they are. But he won't put it in there, so we don't, we don't know anything about it. it comes the day to do, to do the job and we're like, there's nothing in the calendar. Just get rid of the two apps. I don't care if it's yard book, jobber, copa, it doesn't matter. Just get rid of the two apps because it's killing you right now because you can't track your close ratio. I want to do just Copilot. Like That's why I just like up and bought it because I was like tired of dealing with all the different software and yeah. crap. As we're sitting in the office talking to Micah and Luis, multiple times, the crew from out in the field came back to the office because their credit cards kept getting declined with non-sufficient funds. There wasn't enough money on the card to go get the materials needed to do their job for the day. I don't know what was going on, whether it was his bank, whether it was his card, whether it was, is there money in the bank? We don't know yet. I mean, it's $800. I mean, it is a big purchase, but not very big. Two cars shouldn't be bouncing. So, I don't know. Yeah, there was a great example of I just got a text when they were at Lowe's and they said the car decline. So, yeah, it's a great example of yeah. financial issues. <laughs> It's been hours since the day started and the crew still hasn't got their materials or got to their very first job. But yeah, like, like it's really important to be in one software, mostly so I can know one number and that's close ratio. And for now, like until you're in Copilot, I would literally have a board that it's like every estimate you send, you make a little check. Even if it's like, like 
tic-tac-toe or whatever it's called. Like just mark them. Because my opinion is right now, you're probably closing only around 20% of your jobs. They literally might have one question about one type of bush on your design, but because we never followed up with them, they just never get around to it. And they just take the next guy who comes along and follows up with them and says, hey, were those bushes the right ones? Yeah. Number of estimates accepted divided by number of estimates that were sent. Right? That, that percentage is so important. Because I believe by tracking it, you'll see, oh, if we do offer Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and I'm able to get the estimates within a day, we can get the close ratio from 25, 30% to 50%. Yeah. Having a process for follow-up to make sure they actually opened up the email, also really important. They didn't have to spend a single dollar more in marketing. They didn't have to buy, get more admin. They didn't have to buy more trucks. We just doubled our business by going from 30%. Now we got to 60%. Close ratio. Just doubled our business. Just doubled your business. That's crazy if you think about that. The thing that makes me really mad here is the fact that when it comes to getting an estimate in the inbox of a customer, it doesn't take a whole lot of work to make sure they actually open it up. You can automate the process using text messages, email reminders, and making sure the customer got the quote, you answer any questions, and then you close the deal. The fact that there's so many estimates have been sent and never even opened up or ever even followed up on is really, really bad. Now, Copilot CRM is where we build all of our automations, both for text message and emails, and Copilot CRM is a product that I've built with my team and I wanted to actually really quickly take this opportunity to say that if you're wanting to join Copilot, I recommend you do it before the end of this month. At the end of December 2023, we'll be raising the price. Now, we're offering something to anyone that joins before the end of December and that is a price lock guarantee for life, which means that the monthly subscription of your enterprise level subscription will not change forever. We are going to be raising the prices January 1st, 2024. We have added all of these features in 2023. Now in adding all those features, we've moved very quickly and we have there's been some bumps and bruises along the way for sure. And so for the early adopters that joined in 2023, I want to make sure that they have this price lock guarantee as a way of saying thank you. So if you'd like to be in that, I don't want to be a surprise when we raise prices in January. So make sure you join the enterprise level subscription before the end of 2023 to get that price lock guarantee so your price never, ever goes up. In terms of like two, like, Bringing down costs, I know a big thing that you mentioned to Zach even was like having, you know, someone that you've overpaid to be a manager and now they're just an employee. Like, yeah. is that something that we need to actually address? Yeah, we've talked about this. Like, I've talked about this to everybody. But yeah. It's to a point where it's like, I love them to death. I would do anything for them. You know, literally take a bullet for the guy. Mm -hmm. Best friend. Mm -hmm. But like, I hired him thinking he would basically not be able to run this for me, but just like do a lot more than what I've like seen him be able to do. Maybe it doesn't have. <laughs> he knew he could trust me, so. Jacob's more of the handyman guy, know it all. So how, how much is he overpaid right now per hour? So he's at 24 an hour and Jacob's at 20 an hour. Jacob asked for a raise to 22, mm -hmm. which I'm willing to give him because mm -hmm. he's worth that. Mm -hmm. But the, the one at 24, just being completely frank about like what it, like what he's worth, just as what I see him producing, mm -hmm. is like 18 an hour, something like that. Does Jacob know he's getting paid 24? I don't. We don't really talk about it. Like me to get where I'm at, like I had to like work real hard. Yeah, he pretty much. Didn't have to work at it. Like, we don't just, like share everybody's like pay. Okay. Just because I like to keep that private. Yeah. With yeah. Everyone. Yeah. I think he needs to hire some more people to help him. Maybe not have any kind of personal relationship. That way they have to earn their spot, not just be permanent because they're permanent. You know. Like when I pay people, I want to be like excited that mm -hmm. I'm sending them this money mm -hmm. because they did a killer job. I'm not gonna lie, dude. Every time I send Jacob his paycheck, I'm like, this dude freaking earned it. Well, like, when I pay Etienne, I'm like, dude, I'm sending him all this money. Like, he did not earn this. Mm -hmm. This is not, like, what he earned. It's a lot harder than somebody thinks it is. <laughs> When you first start your business, a lot of times you will hire friends or family at first because you trust them. But as the company grows and you get outsiders as employees, you need to make sure you hold everybody accountable to the same standards in the business. The other day, he like, we got a flat tire in a truck and he was had on a jack, 
was taking the wheel off. He didn't put the parking brake on, and the truck fell onto the ground because a car drove by. And it fell on the ground, like smashed the brake caliper, and then he like punched the truck. He got mad. He got mad and like hit my truck. So like that's something like I don't care who you are, I'm gonna take that seriously and address that because for one, it's my property, and for two, when you act like that as a leader, you're gonna make people think that they can just act like that. Mm -hmm. Like if one person sees you disrespect me and disrespect my stuff, mm -hmm. even subconsciously, it'll let them know that, hey, I can get away with that, mm -hmm. and I don't want that. Some people are gonna get away with whatever they can get away with. It's kind of one of them deals. If he wasn't your friend, would you have already fired him? Yeah, I talked about that. I told him that face to face. I said, dude, if you weren't my friend, you would have been gone the moment you hit my truck. Because I don't put up with that. That's childish actions. Like, I don't put up with that. It could get in the way sometimes of having your best friend as your, as your boss. It's hard to take them seriously, even though you, know, you have to when it comes to his businesses. And like, I so firing him, you're afraid that it's going to ruin the relationship. But it sounds to me like it's going to ruin the relationship him staying on. Yeah, just, it's I not even ruining the though. relationship. It's like, I just don't want to put anybody in a hard place. So how do I... Do you think he's going to have a hard time finding a job? No. There's plenty of jobs out there. You can go find another job pretty easy. But yeah. You never want to lose a friendship over something like this. Friendship like what we got going on. I would feel terrible about not giving him a couple weeks to just like find something. Oh yeah. Like, and like he has a kid and like he literally has another one due. You never tell someone, hey, I'm giving you giving you your two week notice and I'm firing you two weeks. You are asking for disaster. You always have to cut it off fast. The business pays the wages. If the business does not exist, the wages do not exist. So either you're going to lose your job because we go out of business or you're going to lose your job because you need to go find someplace else where you get more money, right? Thanks, dude. So, um, yeah, that would be a tough one, but like, I think you can do both. So. Sorry. Um, just come on in. <laughs> yeah, let's knock this out right now. <laughs> That's kind of embarrassing. I guess I do have a question for you. So God forbid this were happened. So like, Etienne comes to Louise and say, you dropped my hourly rate, but you raised his. What Why? the heck? How would he go about explaining that to Etienne? Like, it's not, you know what I mean? Yeah, because I want to say this too. Like, if I was to be just dead blunt about everything, like, leave all feelings aside, just tell him how it is. I'd be like, man, I thought you were, you know, fit to be a manager. Like, when I hired you, just from knowing you, I thought you were bought into what I do. I thought you, like, were passionate about, like, coming into business with me. And like working, working out in my, in my business, and I'd be like, "Hey, you're getting way overpaid for like what you're willing to do." Yeah, but you can't say. So, that how to would people. you explain that to them without comparing the work that Jacob does compared to the work that Etienne does? You would do that in the event that he comes back to you, and but the problem that you have right now is you don't have the numbers to actually show who's more efficient. Right. We don't have that, but sure. I think it sounds like everyone kind of knows it. Yeah. So why in the world would anyone have a problem with him making two dollars more an hour? Because right now, if I was him, I'd be ticked off too. The path that you just talked about is gonna stroke your ego and make him feel bad. If you take the, what you just said, yeah, right, and that's, that's why most people do. That. Yeah. Do yeah. not touch it with a yeah. ten foot pole. This is we cannot afford this, and I am doing this for the good of the whole company, and I hate it. Mm -hmm. And I've been trying to avoid this conversation for an entire year, or however long it's been. And I, I know you're gonna hate me for this, and I hate myself for this. But we have to cut the pay. And if he blows up. You take very humility, like just humble. You just took someone's job away. And ultimately, you made the decision to hire him as a manager. Yeah. It's not his fault. He didn't ask for 24. You offered him the money. So it's your fault he didn't work out, right? So if you take that approach, you'll be more humble with it. And yes, you're disappointed. Yes, he could have done better, blah, 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 blah. Don't bring that up. Wrong moment, wrong time. Wrong place, wrong time. And if it really did have to come to this matter of you have to actually bring up this whole like manager, and he's like, well, you said I was gonna be a manager. You just say, I was wrong. I, I, I was hoping that you would step into that role, but I failed you to give you the time necessary and the education, and I thought there was more skills there, and that is my fault. 
So take more accountability. Oh yeah, like who's fault? It's not his fault. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. not his fault. Like if, if we were making a bunch of money right now, you'd probably just keep letting him make you twenty four dollars an hour. Yeah. That's the honest truth. If everything was dialed in the systems and we were profitable, you would be having this conversation. So just take ownership of it. It's my fault. I'm running this business really bad, and now I'm trying to clean it up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I hate that you're in the crosshairs of that. Yeah, it's like honestly, like, I wish if I could look back on it and like redo it, like. I just wouldn't hire anybody that's a close friend that I could potentially put in a bad spot or hurt by firing one day. Mm-hmm. But you can gracefully do it. Yeah. I had to do the same thing to one of my closest relatives. Had to take away his franchise, right? Strip him away. The one, only two people have ever done that from. And because it was done correctly, two years later he came back and is now an extremely profitable location and general manager and works for me yeah. instead of a franchisee. So it's how you handle it. Just because it's not working out now doesn't mean it It's all how you handle it. Take the path of like humility, I was wrong, I made the mistake, I'm really sorry, and unfortunately I also have to take your job away or reduce pay because I'm trying to protect everyone here. Yeah. And that's all, that's all you can do. If someone gets mad, that it just happens. It's just, yeah. Yeah. We made the decision. Yeah. To get a closer look at the operations of Freedom Lawn Care, we decided to go to one of their job sites and it is not what we expected. We didn't know what we were dealing with. Uh, I thought it was just a little deck here and it's uh, a lot bigger than what I thought it was gonna be. So we show up at this job at 11.30 a.m. Literally it's been three hours since the day started and we're just showing up to the first job because of all the back and forth at Home Depot and non-sufficient funds on the credit cards, it's been a joke. Furthermore, the lumber that we purchased at Home Depot is the wrong size for the job. I thought we were just replacing my little two by fours and stuff. But wait, there's more. We show up at the job and the customer comes out and is literally like, why are you guys here? I was never notified. And sure enough, I look up on the deck and there's a whole bunch of stuff sitting on the deck. We can't even do the job today. I'll either, I'll either have to go ask the homeowner or have to call him to come him, to bring him in. And that just takes time away from us being able to work. For a brief minute in the office during this turnaround, I thought potentially we could turn this business around and we could try to juggle all these businesses that Luis is running. But honestly, after seeing the chaos that ensued on this project and seeing how disorganized the office was and the follow-up process, I really do believe, and I've never said it before in the turnaround show, but I really do believe he should close down the lawn care and landscaping business, focus on his hunting business, and come back into the industry later on down the road. 